Welcome back to the Wizard Shop, and today is a day in victory. I have triumphed over one of the most difficult engines for mechanics to diagnose and fix in history. Let's take a look. So this is a 1982 Jaguar XJS and it's not had its guts ripped out and replaced with a Chevy 350 like so many of them have been. This is one of my good friends who has a dealership, sells cars. It's not EuroAsian Bob, it's a different person. They bought this car, it won't start, and they just knew from the history of these cars they don't even want to begin to tackle it. They said, Car Wizard, are you interested in this car? And I really enjoy challenges. I said, bring it on, I'll conquer this. And I have. There are a lot of the XJ12s, XJS, any of these with the V12 with Chevy 350s in them. You can go on Bring a Trailer, you can go on different places that sell these older cars, and it'll say in the description, been converted to an SBC. It's because these engines, even the best of mechanics, will make them pull their hair out. If they have any, I don't, I don't have any. But it'll make them pull their hair out, and they'll be like, I am done with this. We're putting a 350. I'm tired of this. I can't get it to run. I can't get it to start. I'm ready to light this thing on fire. And that's pretty much the scenario that happened here. Like I said, the, the owner of this car knew it wasn't going to be something they're going to try to tackle. We're going to go over today everything that was wrong from somebody else. It's not my friend. There was somebody else that tried to fix this car and get it running and made the situation worse than it should have been but I still reign victorious. Let's open the hood and take a look. Got my handy dandy hood prop. Any of these hoods that have hydraulic supports that are gone bad, that definitely helps to clamp it and hold it into place. You don't have to worry about damaging these because they're already ruined and failed anyway. That would be something we might address, but the main thing here was can we even get the thing to run? So you look at this engine and it just looks like a mess of wires and all kinds of things going on and they are very complicated. Even for me it was quite the challenge, it's very difficult, but we went through all the different steps, everything that I know about these engines. So let's take a look at some of the components on the engine, some of the high failure points. One of them is the ignition amplifier, which is right here, or ignition control module. That can commonly cause issues where it's not sparking or it's not sending a signal out to the computer that the engine's turning. These do not have a crank sensor. The newer models that have the Magneti Morelli system on them do, but this one is the old Lucas system. The computer knows the engine's turning and turns on the fuel based on the pulse signal it receives from the ignition module. Okay. Car wizard, you said the scary word. Lucas. Yes, there is Lucas everywhere on this car. It's also another reason why people give up on these cars. As long as you have an open mind and you say, okay, I know this is really strange, but it doesn't matter, it still has to be fixed, then you can usually make good progress on these. But if you're an old school mechanic and you start seeing the word Lucas print on and everything and you start throwing wrenches across the shop, it's definitely going to be an exercise in futility for you. So, the next thing that can go bad on these is in the distributor inside of there is a pickup coil kind of a trigger wheel and a magnetic sensor a Hall effect sensor is what it is and it actually controls a signal to this ignition control module and you see there's ignition coil here's the turn buckle I guess you would call it or the for the both throttles the AC compressor the injectors are individually right here. The spark plugs are not down here on the outside where you would think they would be. They're actually deep in there. You see the spark plug wire goes right down to the spark plug. They're actually in the V of the engine. They're still in the cylinder heads, but kind of in the V of the engines where they're at. So kind of easy to get to. I'm actually glad that they're there. So we'll kind of just do a quick rundown when the car comes in the shop and it's not running. It's an XJS, a V12, 
Immediately there's a lot of things that I need to go through to see what's going on here. Some mechanics would try extravagant different things, but it's really, there's like four or five pinpoint things that's really simple on these engines. Let's take a look at the first one. 12 volt test light. Hook to ground and on the negative side of the coil. It should see it flicker when I crank it over. I purposely have the coolant temperature sensor unplugged so it wouldn't start. Once it starts it's so fast you won't see the flicker, but I seen that the light wasn't solid, which it was when it first came in here. Now it flickers and pulses like it's supposed to, and that's because when it came in here the ignition module was dead. Here's a really cool cost saving trick I'm going to give you. This looks like an expensive Lucas ignition module and you think, oh wow, that's going to be $500, some expensive, expensive item to I have to get on eBay or something and try to find that. If you take this cover, just take these two bolts loose and flip it over, what you'll see is this 1985 Chevy K5 Blazer ignition module, HEI, or a van or truck or whatever. That's all it is. It sits in there like this. This plugs into this end of it, and those two go to some wires out here. That's all that's in there. Pretty crazy, huh? So I put a new one of these in. Actually ordered it for an 85 Chevy K5 Blazer. So I got that replaced, and it still wasn't pulsing, so I got my oscilloscope and hooked to this. Actually, my Autel oscilloscope is over there. It's what I used to check this out. The two wires coming out of the distributor when you hook it to resistance reading, you should see a nice cyclic pattern. It shows the engine's turning and the sensor's actually reading. And it was. But someone had been in there, had hooked up a wire, done some kind of wiring, and it wasn't even connected properly. So that's when I know somebody's been in here before. So I got all that sorted out. I got, had this module replaced. Now I can get it to flicker but it would start to try and want to run, but it was like there was, wasn't enough gas, and when it did run, it would backfire really loud. Sound like a shotgun. I thought, what in the world could be wrong with that? I checked all my timing, I checked spark plugs. Finally, under the main pulley is a little indicator panel. It has little lines on it, top dead center, zero, 10, 20 degrees. I put it at zero. Put it on the top of the compression stroke on A1, this A and B, and the distributor was 180 degrees out. So, you know, when cars come into the shop, you don't anticipate that. You're thinking, okay, there's a module failed. You don't realize you're having to backtrack and unscrew the last guy's screw-ups. That's when it really starts, people start throwing wrenches, mechanics get really mad. But I didn't get mad. I decided, it's not going to win. I'm going to win. So I got the distributor properly timed and it would try to start. It was a lot better and it would run for a few seconds and die. And that reason was this. This little wire here is a trigger wire that goes back to the computer. The white portion of this wire that goes down along the firewall here is actually a coaxial wire. Kind of like a cable TV back in the old days. The cable had a center wire and then a metal sheath around the center wire. That's exactly what that is. It's just really small. But right in here was a broken section where it was shorting out. And at times it would start, and other times it wouldn't. I have this temporarily put in place just for testing purposes, and it works. But that wasn't the end of the story. I still wasn't done. I finally got spark. I occasionally would get fuel. I finally got this fixed where it should get fuel all the time, but I still didn't because those were shorted out for so long I think it took the computer out. Let's take a look in the trunk. So it's kind of a mess in here. There's stuff all in here. This is not my car, but 
it's just storage for items. It's not really dirty. It's just right now I have a computer that I bought from SGA. This is a 16 CU computer. I have an 86 Jag. The original computer, which is right here, I'm no longer using, is a 6 CU. But where they're known for the fuel relay inside of it to fail and it will not turn on the fuel. I think it failed because those wires were shorted out up front that I showed you and it finally killed it. There's another interesting thing about these computers. You think on a 1987 Chevy truck there's a map sensor under the hood. It's a little black box. Every, we've all seen it. It's, it's a map sensor. On these cars the map sensors inside the ECM right here where you can see the vacuum line going to it. I'll unplug it and show you. Right there. The ECM is inside the computer. So if you change out computers, remember to swap this over. or It'll run really bad. So now we have an upgraded 16 CU. This is an upgrade to these commonly failing 6 CU computers. And it ran. Let's go back to the engine bay. So this thing hasn't ran in a long time. Whoever worked on it last, it might have been two, five, ten, I don't know how many years ago. And from what I just described, they really butchered the job. I could have really found a couple things, a couple issues and be in business, but it had to undo the screw-ups that the last guy did on top of the original failure problems. Those kind of issues can throw even the best of mechanics for a loop. Why is this not starting? I expect that the timing should be right on this engine. No, you shouldn't expect that. This is proof that it was completely out of whack. 180 degrees out, it was backfiring really loud. And it's easy, it's easy to think, oh, it can't be the timing. Why not? Yes, it can. It can be a lot of different things. What was the last person doing that was in here? What were they doing? Who knows? It could be anything. So we got it running. Let's start it up. So it hasn't ran in years, and now it finally is running again. Guess what you find whenever you get something running that hasn't ran for years? You think you've got it running, your problems are over, you're done. All that does is open a can of worms and find the next problems down the line that couldn't be found until the engine was running. One of them is when I first got it running, this thing was like a smoke screen. It would just completely smoke up the whole shop. It was running so rich. I did a little trick over here. Let me show you where the coolant temperature sensor is. So you can see the, the actual sensor is right there. I have it unplugged at the moment. And you can see a loop of wire I have. It, I have it flattened out so it fits without damaging the terminals in there. But this is a trick that you can do on these old Jags. A straight across piece of wire like that simulates a fully warmed up engine. And when I did that, the smoke went away. It runs perfect. No smoke. Very smooth. Now you heard a minute ago I had a long cranking time. That's because I have the coolant temperature sensor bypassed. If I were to hook it back into its normal sensor, it would, it would run and start right up, but it would be smoking the shop out again really bad. So is this car done? No. We're only halfway there. We have to replace the coolant temperature sensor still and there's an oil leak. I'm not sure where that's coming from. And it, I believe it needs new spark plugs. These are very sensitive to spark plugs in the gap. I believe those need to be replaced. We've got it running. The last, obviously the last people could not get it running. I've gotten it running. 
And there's a reason why it's so popular to put the Chevy 350s in here, because it is that hard to diagnose these engines. It really is. If you're looking to buy one of these cars and you see it on Facebook Marketplace that says not ran in five years and you think, I'm going to be a hero and get in there and rescue this car and get it running again, this is not the car for you unless you're very knowledgeable with cars. Because there we go again, I can't figure it out, I'm going to put a 350 in it and be done. Let's get it on the lift and see what we got going on with the oil leak. I just noticed when I moved it, there's a pretty nice oil puddle underneath. Oil puddle wasn't there until we got it running. So let's find out what that is. This thing runs really good. As you heard, I just did a little chirp with the with the gas pedal. The first time I took it out, I gave it gas and it had a lot more power than I was expecting. So this is a really powerful engine. So let's get this thing on the lift. Let's see what's going on underneath. Got some cool little insignia on here. It's got a V12 emblem and a Jaguar emblem there. Pretty neat looking. Let's take a look through here. We can see if there's any coolant leaks going on. I don't see anything atrocious happening. Okay, so let's see what we got under here. Right here's the timing plate I was talking about. You can line up the uh, main pulley and figure out the timing on it. But somewhere under here, we're having some big oil leaks. Let's see what we got. I, don't, I mean, I see some seepage here, but it's not like it's pouring out of there. Let's see what else we got. There we go, it's coming somewhere over in here. The exhaust is all coated in oil. It's right up by the starter. Coming up from top of the engine somewhere. You can see it's all wet in there. That's engine oil, it's not transmission fluid. You can see it's pretty bad through here too. So we need to look on top and see what's going on as well. We'll go ahead and look at the rest of the car. It's definitely coming from that area over there. Brakes look okay. That looks pretty gunky. Probably needs to be cleaned and greased. Nothing loose there. I went and drove it and I didn't see anything. That boot up there looks a little damaged. I didn't see anything too bad. Look over here. It's gunky again. Ugh. Years of road grime. That boot is damaged as well. Some brake pads, they look fine. Here's our two cats. Dual exhaust all the way back. There's some seepage coming from the speedometer cable and the transmission fluid there. You can see a little bit of a drip there. Check the drive shaft. That's good. This is interesting how they did the speed sensor. There's a little sensor here, and there's just a flange. They put welded notches on it or something. There's two of them, one there and one 180 degrees. That's pretty neat. Wow, that's the same technology that's used on my bike. Yeah, basically it is. Here's an interesting thing about these old Jags. If you're looking for the brakes in the wheels, they're not there. They're right here by the differential. The rotors and the brake calipers are right next on either side of the differential. You can see it there. Luckily the pads look good. 
kind of a weird setup. They did that for years and years. I don't know why. Check this wheel over here. I don't see too much going on there. Big old trunk and two tailpipes off the back. Well, let's go ahead and lower it down and see what we see on the oil leak up top. coming from that side over there near the rear of the engine we can see an oil pressure sending unit right in the middle there that's it's clean right where it comes out it looks like oil is coming out of where the, the seam of it where the plastic meets the metal you can see towards the back of the engine there's a big puddle of oil and it's coming from that sensor so it's going to need a new sensor there. It's literally spraying oil out. So that's not so bad. We'll replace that sensor. It'll take care of that massive oil leak. It's really gushing out of there. So let's do a little recap here. In order to make this non-running car running again, we had to get it sparking again, which was an ignition control module. Then we realized it wasn't getting a good signal from the distributor because the wiring had been finagled with and messed with and we got that fixed. Now we have spark, it's still not running. We found that the coaxial cable was damaged, I repaired that. Then we found out the computer was bad and then we got it kind of running and it was backfiring so bad and it was something wasn't right with the timing. We found out the distributor was out of time, 180 degrees. Once we got all those things figured out, it runs great. It runs very good. We definitely need to get that oil pressure sending unit replaced and maybe do a tune-up on it and a few other things. Really, it'd be a running and driving car again. So this is a common thing I run into with many other customers as they say, hey car wizard, I've got a $5,000 budget. This car hasn't ran in 15 years. Let's go ahead and get it running again. And they have it in their mind that the only thing that needs to be done is to get it running again. And if it takes four or five grand, that's fine. But they don't realize, just in this scenario here, getting it running only exposes the five or ten other problems that the engine had before it stopped running. And it's going to be another three or four or five grand to fix it. And I commonly hear the same, same statement, I, ha I hadn't thought that I'd have to spend this much money. I thought we would get it running and that was it. It never, ever happens that way. This is easily going to be a thousand dollars or more to go through and just figure out what was wrong. The parts necessarily weren't so expensive. It was just figuring out what was going on. There is no OBD2 port that your scan tool can hook into, your common modern scan tool. These are one of the cars that your scan tool needs to be up here. You can use oscilloscopes, voltmeters, all kinds of different test equipment to figure out what's going on, fuel pressure gauge. You can actually pull out that old timing light in the bottom drawer of your toolbox? Yeah, we probably will on this car to check it out, do the timing on it. This is a mixture of old school 1950s stuff with modern fuel injection and wiring. It's kind of a combination of the both. You still have a distributor, you still have to get it timed, kind of, kind of a mix of both things. Like I mentioned a minute ago, if you see these on Marketplace, and you're not an expert mechanic, probably not the car for you because you're just going to take it out and put a 350 in it. That's happened so many times. That's not going to be the case here. We got it running. So we'll have a happy customer. They got what they came here for. We'll fix the few other things we found after we got it running and give it back to the customer. If you're curious what kind of tools we use in the shop other than the test light or the hood clamp that we use, there's many other tools I have listed in my Amazon affiliate page in the description below. We get a small cut and we appreciate that. And if you haven't hit the subscribe button already, I really recommend that you do that now. Many, many more cool videos to come. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.